Welcome back to AP World History. Uh, today we're going to take a look at the exception, according to Crash Course, the Mongols. And uh, we're going to look at this in two parts. The first part is going to go over uh, just pastoralist societies and uh, the kind of culture of the Mongols and the rise of Genghis Khan. And then the second part we'll look at the Mongols' conquests and the effects of the Mongol conquests. So, starting us off here, pastoral societies. Remember, uh, they're the societies that are based on animal husbandry. Um, where they raise animals and they um, move around with them so they're nomadic and um, they uh, use that as their main source of food because the land they're living on is not good enough to grow crops on. So they live in small villages because uh, the territory or the land they're on can't support huge populations in a small concentrated area. And uh, they control large areas around them though to graze uh, or for grazing area for their animals. Uh, and so these have to be mobile so they can go to a new greener pasture uh, once they kind of tear up uh, uh, one of the other pastures that they're on. These societies are more egalitarian uh, because, uh, one, women have a lot more rights. There are less restrictions on them. Uh, they have a higher status. They're able to advise the men. It's not looked at as a bad thing that the woman's advising you. And that's because they partake in, in the raising of the animals. Uh, they usually take care of the smaller animals and then... Uh, that at least lays the foundation for the family for then those large animals that they get and rely on. Um, also, it's easier to rise up in social classes usually. If you can show that you're a good warrior um, or you can raise your animals well, you, you become a good leader, you can rise up. And that's what's going to happen to Timogen here uh, when we look at him, who's later known as Genghis Khan. Um, they're also, because they're based in these small clans, warfare isn't as large of a scale as we see with civilized societies or sedentary societies that are growing um, crops because the population is as big and um, so they focus more on small scale warfare like clan versus clan or a couple of clans versus a couple other clans. Uh, and then uh, they produce some major contributions for history, for example stirrups, uh, the horse harness uh, which allowed horses to be able to uh, pull plows now. Um, they created the compact bow and many other things but these are some of the main ones that are very, very important to know. So, who are some of these mo or, um, nomadic societies, these pastoralist societies? They're the Huns. Okay, we looked at them. They're the reason for the fall of the Gupta Indias uh, and uh, Western Rome. We have the Xiongnu, who are the ones that are responsible for the fall of the Han Empire or the Han Dynasty. Uh, I think when we talked about that, I said they were the Huns. Uh, and that's a mistake on me. Um, some people will say it's the Huns. Others will say it's more specifically the Xiongnu, uh, since that's their more proper name, uh, where Hun can be just kind of more of a nomadic person at this time. So if you want to be more specific when you talk about the fall of the Han Empire, it's the Xiongnu. Uh, the Arabs who we looked at with the spread of Islam, they were originally nomadic. They didn't really sit down in one area for very long. Um, they were mostly moving around. The Berbers in North Africa who also spread... Um, Islam and are the ones that are uh, one of the major responsible parties for uh, going across the Sahara Desert to get to um, West Africa and start that gold and salt trade. And then the Turks uh, who came into the Abbasid Empire and became the major fighting force for them and helped them hold on to their empire and they'll eventually lead to the fall of the Byzantine Empire that we'll see later uh, in this unit. So. Um, they all move around, and you might notice they did a lot with trade, and they did a lot of going and attacking these uh, agricultural societies and, and causing a bit of damage, like we can see with the Arabs, the Xiongnu, and the Huns, and eventually the Turks. So now, more specifically, Mongo culture. Um, they are nomadic pastoralists, as we've already said. Uh, they raise mainly goats and sheep. Uh, that's their main thing that they're able to grow on the steppes. Uh, they can't have really large and huge animals because... The uh, land just doesn't support them. So uh, goats and sheep are the best thing in that territory. Uh, they're divided into tribes and clans, as we've seen. It's not much different from any normal one. And it's, a lot of it's based on their family alliances. Uh, and it's usually around the male figures. And uh, they live in these mobile homes called yurts. I know it's not up here, but if you look at the uh, picture over to the side, they're putting up the siding and everything for that. That's a yurt. Uh, that's what they lived in. allows them to be mobile. Um, and then... Um, Last thing here, because they're mobile, because they're based on clans, they can join up and create larger clans or what we might call confederacies where they, uh, you have large groups of uh, clans coming together saying they're all 
allied with each other. Now, this doesn't happen very often. Um, that's what makes Genghis Khan's achievement so spectacular. Uh, and uh, when they do come together, it's not just like the person that started it that gets to be the leader of it. It's they actually elect their leaders. Now, being that Genghis Khan is a great leader, uh, very charismatic and everything else, everyone goes and says, yeah, Genghis Khan, you've done all this. I think you need to lead us. Uh, but there are times where that doesn't necessarily happen. Okay. So now Genghis Khan. Uh, he's also known as Genghis Khan, uh, also known as Timujin. Uh, Timujin is born roughly around 1162 CE, uh, and he was on the bottom of society. As you saw uh, in the reading that we've done um, on Genghis Khan, whether he's a hero or not, uh, he rises from the bottom because his father's killed by Tartars. His mother is then kind of kicked out of the tribe, or out of the clan, and then um, with that, he's got to rise up uh, and come over all the circumstances that are there in his life, and he does successfully. He starts by uh, taking on people that, uh, taking on a clan that steals his wife away when he's getting married, and then he goes on and kills all the Tartars who had, or many of the Tartars who had uh, killed his father. And then he goes through the rest of Mongolia, starting to reunite more and more and more of those clans to eventually where he brings in all the clans. And he unites them all together, and that will make him uh, Chinggis Khan or Genghis Khan or the Great Khan. <coughs> and so, when he does this, when he goes around and unites the clans, uh, he's doing this with his mounted warriors. That's the main fighting force for the Mongols as they ride their horses, uh, use arrows, um, to attack at a distance, um, they will re he will though when he goes and um, conquers other clans, he'll reorganize the groups and he'll keep the best warriors from that clan and bring them into his army, uh, while maybe getting rid of some of the other people that might be causing problems, and then he reorganized it into into an actual organized military, like a professional military of units of ten, a uh, hundred, and thousand uh, group troops or sets of troops, so that they can be maneuvered much easier. And uh, he was never afraid to adopt technology. So we'll see once he, after he unites the tribes, or the clans, uh, when he goes into China and other regions, he will adopt their technology. For example, the Mongols don't need to know much about siege warfare when they're fighting each other because they don't have any permanent settlements with large walls. However, when you get to China, uh, agricultural societies have made lots of walls because they want to keep the nomads out or other agricultural societies out from taking over their cities and taking their store of supplies and goods. So they build large walls. Horses going in and attacking walls doesn't work too well, and so they learn siege engine craft from um, surrounding areas. Uh, he will also create a bureaucracy, just as we've seen in most of the major empires, to help run things because one person cannot just run the whole show. And so he gets the best and most capable people that he trusts to run the government for him. And uh, a lot of this is done by foreigners that he's captured, that, have, that he's seen work well in China or worked well in the Middle East, uh, and brings them into the fold and says, hey, uh, I need you to run this thing for me. And they kind of have a choice, but don't necessarily have as much of a choice as they would like to have. Um, and so they can either do that or they might be killed, as we see with... Um, a lot of the treatment of the Mongols to people that didn't want to do what they asked them to do. And so, they go around uh, and they'll start conquering after they reunite uh, Mongolia. And uh, we'll see Genghis Khan, by the end of his life, he's the green area here, will conquer all uh, that we see in 1227. He'll conquer that whole green area in his lifetime. Um, he'll die unexpectedly uh, while being pretty old by falling from his horse. Uh, and then... Uh, over the next 60, 70 years or so, his grandsons and his son will expand uh, things beyond the borders that they had, going into Russia, going into uh, the Middle East, and going into uh, China. And so uh, they will make the largest uh, land empire in history um, by the end of their, uh, by the end of the Mongol Empire's reign.